Hey, Westside, and all anyone listening in, we're in our Ephesians series, our Insanity series, and it's all about living out our calling in an insane, crazy world. Uh, I looked up some headlines this week and just kind of cherry picked four of them. One was a headline about mutant vaccines, how with COVID and the pandemic, there are just new varieties of COVID that we need to be aware of, that does the vaccine work? Thank goodness it does against these uh, mutant varieties. That's really good. American politics as, oh, we've had enough American politics. It's been crazy. Um, maybe I'll move on. Uh, in China, maybe some more pandemic news. There's a second way in China now to test for the coronavirus. And maybe I shouldn't say this. The second way is, um, can I say this word? It's like a rectal swab. And I just said that. So now parents have to explain to their children what that means. Um, uh, that's crazy. And then in Oklahoma, uh, a bill has been introduced it's by one person, I believe, not like an entire group, but well, one person has introduced a bill to create a Bigfoot hunting season. An actual hunting season, a few weeks in fall, where you could hunt Bigfoot. Now, of course, there's some common sense here. Uh, the hunting season would be actually to capture Bigfoot. It wouldn't be to actually kill a Bigfoot. So it's pretty normal behavior for a state, is it legislature? I'm not sure what the terminology is, but uh, there's fascinating things going on in the world around us. It's crazy out there. So we have a series going through Ephesians on how we are to be, uh, well, what we believe and how we behave, um, because our belief affects our behavior. And uh, to that end, we had an intro in the yurt. We can't just escape society. We are called to engage with society. Uh, in a way, though, that's healthy, Christ-centered, peace-loving, love-giving way. So our first week, we talked about that you need spiritual intelligence. That's a word that's right behind me. You probably can't see it. And then last week, Donovan talked about being included. That word back there, just how the gospel message, there needs to be spiritual wisdom in chapter 1. And chapter 2 in Ephesians is about the inclusivity of the gospel message. It is a message for all. Everyone is invited. What a beautiful truth. And this week we are talking about uh, real, we're talking about, we're about, well, the word is ingrained. So that's that word over there. And what does ingrained mean? It is, uh, if you look it up in the dictionary, it is a habit, a belief, or an attitude firmly fixed or established, difficult to change. There's just something about when we understand the ways of Jesus, making it ingrained or think of it as maybe those grass stains on your knees when you're a kid or if you have children, you're just so hard to get out because you've been just grinding into the grass. There's something about taking these beliefs that Paul talks about uh, when it comes to who Jesus is and what that means for our lives and kind of grinding it into our soul so it becomes a, a part of us. It's ingrained in us. So that's where we're going to go with chapter 3. So what types of habits or beliefs or attitudes are we hoping to have ingrained in us? Paul starts out in Ephesians 3 by kind of reestablishing his credentials and mission in verse 1. When I think of all this, I, Paul, a prisoner, a, a prisoner, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the benefit of you Gentiles. Remember, Paul is Jewish, and he's writing this letter to Ephesus, mostly uh, Gentiles, people who are not Jewish, uh, believers. Assuming, by the way, that you know God gave me the special responsibility of extending His grace to you Gentiles. Again, the Gentiles were out. And now they are in through Jesus Christ, which was a radical, radical way of thinking, of teaching. And then in verse 3, as I briefly wrote earlier, God himself revealed his mysterious plan to me. Remember in chapter 1, 
talking about the mysterious plan. And it's not something that's hidden, but it's a secret that's been revealed. And the mystery or secret that has been revealed is that the Gentiles are in, along with the Jews. They're co-heirs of Jesus, of the kingdom, joined together. They're the same family. And this is, I don't know, it's like two families that should never be together. I don't know if you're in conflict with a family or if there's a group of people that you, I don't know, maybe you think they're other or they're not, I don't know, maybe there's something that does not mix or mesh. Uh, think of that family and here, these are the Jews and the Gentiles and God meshes them together, brings them together and makes them, creates them this, into the same family. And it seems like this gospel never ceased to amaze Paul. He, like this is a few years after Paul has had his encounter uh, with Jesus and has been, his mind has been renewed and he is going in a completely different direction. And he's already told us, right, about the gospel message and what the gospel is in chapter 2. Go back if you haven't read it. And the first thing is, uh, I'll help you out. First, God has taken spiritually dead people and has made them alive by grace through the faith of, a pe of the people. And secondly, he has taken two groups and he has put them together and he creates a new family. Actually, the verbiage, the language is he has created a new humanity a new way to be human. Um, we, we, along with Paul, need to understand the radical implications, the societal and cultural change that would come about when you see a group of people that were once out, but are now in. A group that was once, you saw as unclean, that you could not hang out with, or if you did, you would have to wash yourselves. It's like we think we have to wash a little bit when we come into contact with people now. And maybe now more than ever, we have a better understanding of what it means to come in contact with people who we feel could be or are unclean. Think of it this way. If you came into contact with someone who you were pretty sure had COVID, was carrying COVID, uh, what would you do? You would wash your hands. Uh, you would mask up while you were with that person. Um, and maybe you would isolate yourself so someone else didn't become contaminated or become toxic through that per other person's toxicity. Well, here, this is kind of the way the Jews saw Gentile people. So people who are out, unclean, are now in, kind of made clean through Jesus Christ. Uh, so for an insider, former insider, that would be, whoa, hard to believe. And if, there are, if you're an outsider, if you've heard this new message and you take it to heart, well, that's a new message too. We're in, okay. and. Maybe people are, I think some people are, I'm in. Maybe I'm more in than maybe you are. It's just fascinating what can happen when we encounter new freedoms through a new belief. And so Paul in this is like trying to just saying, just taking the time to, to write that you belong together now. This is a new humanity, a whole new way to live. And then he goes on to verse 8. And in this chapter, uh, verse 8 is, well, he, he does this a few times. And in verse 8, this is how he starts it. Though I am the least deserving of all God's people. Why would Paul think that? Well, remember, if you know about Paul, Paul was persecuting the Gentiles. He, he was persecuting the Jews. He was uh, saying the, the Jews who were converting to Christianity to following Jesus Christ, he was persecuting them, throwing them in jail, having them killed. Uh, he was like, yeah, the least deserving of anyone would have been Paul. And Paul is now put in charge of getting the message out to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles are the people that I think he was just persecuted through his view on them, his take on them, his prejudice on these people. So he's the least of these people. He's like the least deserving it's a great verse. So though I am the least deserving of all God's people, he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles. He's like, no, I don't have to tell you. It's like, I get to tell you. I have this privilege. 
It's really cool. And then I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan, this divine secret that the creator of all things had kept secret from the beginning. So this is a new revelation. The secret has now been revealed. And now we go to verse 10. If you remember what I said in two weeks ago, if you were listening in, uh, key chapters in the key verses in these three first in the first three chapters are uh, one verse ten, chapters two verse ten, and chapter three verse ten. So go look at those three verses because they are pivotal to the teachings in these three. So verse ten, God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display His wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. First of all, God's purpose in all this was to use the church. Paul moves, changes his way of of writing to talking about himself, giving the message, bringing the message to the church now. He makes that great move. And to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety. The church has rich variety. And that word means multicolored, multifaceted, So it's a word like that reveals diversity. How great is that? Diversity. We are to be diverse people brought together in a new humanity, God's family. And then that second part, to display God's wisdom to the unseen rulers and authorities in heavenly places. So I don't know, when I see these verses, I think, okay, we'll do this, and then we'll reveal it to the world around us. But it's actually in the heavenly realm, unseen rulers and authorities, cosmic evil powers working in people and human institutions. Paul now says, this is how, this is the mysterious plan. God's going to use the church to break those evil powers, to reveal God's wisdom to all people on all realms. It's like, look what I did. Through Jesus, I brought these people together. And look, watch what happens. In preparing for this, in in reading some commentaries, uh, there's an Andrew Lincoln, a book on Ephesians, and he writes this. It's the writer of Ephesians thought that it's best understood that by her very existence, the church is a new humanity in which the major division of the first, first century world has been overcome. The church reveals God's secret in action and heralds to the hostile heavenly powers the overcoming of cosmic divisions within or with their defeat. That's the purpose of the church. That's a pretty huge huge purpose. Mark Roberts in the Story of God Bible Commentary. As the church proclaims the good news of God's salvation in Christ and as the church lives out this good news, In a unified community, all of heaven and earth will grasp the wonder and the truth of God's plan for the cosmos. So church is essential. Like, is is church an essential service? Well, the gathering on Sunday mornings, I guess, has not been deemed essential for this season. But the church mission and purpose is absolutely essential. And not just for us, and not just for our communities, but in the cosmic realms. Cosmic powers infiltrate and infect our lives, human life in multiple dimensions. And what happens in the heavens matters to us, has implications for us. And though Paul doesn't say it in Ephesians, he certainly believed that the church's very existence and practice demonstrated to the powers everywhere that God was onto or up to something. If a skeptic were to ask Paul, you know, how do I know your gospel is true? I think Paul would point to the church and said, look, here are Jews and Gentiles who once were enemies are living together in peace. Paul would point to the church. And God points to the church and says, look at the peace and the reconciliation that's happening there. And then that has an effect on the cosmic uh, world and realm and certainly on the earthly level what a teaching that's what we believe if you're reading through ephesians 3 what we believe matters this matters and then 11 to 12 the next key verse um 
Verse 12. Because of Jesus Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. What was never true for the Jewish people is now true for all people. That we can come boldly and confidently. That's not a way that we would normally, or that would have been seen as a good way to approach God. So please don't lose heart because of my trials here. I'm suffering for you, so you should feel honored. There's this movement from our mission or my mission to your mission. Uh, from our mission to we, that, that beautiful language shift, which is not from a person or just a chosen people. To, it's, this is all of us. This is church, the new humanity. So lots of stuff. How does this truth become ingrained in us? Remember, it's a habit or a belief or an attitude firmly fixed or established, difficult to change in us. Well, verse 14, Paul has a prayer for our spiritual growth, our spiritual maturity, something we're all called to do. So in verse 14, the spiritual uh, prayer, or this Paul's prayer for spiritual growth. When I think of all this, even Paul's like, in summary, like when I think of all this, like is your mind blown? It should be blown. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and I pray to the Father. The first thing you see when you read this verse is Paul's posture. His posture in prayer is it drives him to his knees in prayer. Now, prayer for a Jewish person, the posture for prayer would have been standing. It wouldn't have been falling to your knees. But what do you think of when you think of falling to your knees? You think of... Um, falling to your knees to a sovereign, to a king, to a lord. And that's what Paul, Paul thinks of all this, and he goes, it drives me to my knees. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and I pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven on earth. And I pray from his glorious, unlimited resources that he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. So what habit does he have? He has a habit of prayer. And a prayer, and he has a habit of praying for others. How are we praying for others? Boy, if we want to have something ingrained in us, the first habit, the most, probably the most powerful habit we can have is prayer. And praying for others. He is praying for others. This intercessory prayer, like, I will pray for you that you will grow, that you will experience the strength and the power. And he has this posture of humility, of servanthood. And then verse 16 to 17. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he'll empower you with inner strength through his spirit. And then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. uh, Two weeks ago, I talked about this elephant. This is an elephant within an elephant. And we are to be in Christ. 34 times, I believe, it's mentioned that we are to be in Christ as Christ is in us. We are image bearers. We bear the image of Jesus. And we are to be in Jesus. So what do we believe? We believe that we are loved. We believe that we are image bearers. And we believe that that will give us strength through the Holy Spirit. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should. So we have the habit of prayer. We have the belief that we are image bearers and that we are loved. How are we loved? Listen to 18 and 19. And may you have the power to understand, in verse 19, May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. It's like, it's, it's, it's like too much. And before that, he says, may you know how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you know all that. So our beliefs shape our attitudes. If we have an attitude like that, if we believe that, that will shape our attitude. How we view ourselves how we view our place in this earth, uh, in the cosmic realm, uh, and how we view others. What we believe will shape our attitudes. And our attitudes will shape our habits and the way we live and the choices we make. If I believe I'm to be in Christ, in Jesus in me, that affects me and it affects everyone around me. If I believe I am recklessly and unconditionally loved, that will have an effect on me. And then right to the big ending here in 19 or to 21. 
Now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us, remember, it's happening within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. We can never imagine. Our lives matter. They have cosmic relevance and implications. The church matters. Cosmic significance. You know, our lives may seem small. Our church may seem small. The church of Morden, the church of Jesus Christ may seem small, but it's not. And we're all a part of something bigger. And we're a part of what God is doing in the world. Don't ever think that God can't use you. Don't ever think that God can't use us, like West Side or whatever church you're a part of. Our weakness and God's power are a perfect match. We need to have Jesus' truth and his ways ingrained in us, rubbed in like a grass stain you cannot get out, worked deeply into the fabric and the texture and the fiber of our lives. And may we keep growing wider in our message, more inclusive. May we walk longer with people, not giving up on them. May we be higher in our love and our view of who God is and glorify God in all things. And may we go deeper into community and deeper into our mission. That love of Jesus Christ should be so, uh, just may it be so ingrained in us that people notice how amazing God is by how we treat each other. And remember, I don't know, if you're in conflict with someone, take this to heart. Uh, maybe especially if you're in conflict with someone in the church. Um, we were meant to be one family, and we fight for that. We don't fight for other uh, things that divide us. We fight for what you, can unite us, and that's Jesus Christ because that has cosmic implications. Let's pray. So Lord, you are amazing. You are here. You are good. I pray that we are embracing who you are. May we be spiritually intelligent, Lord. Just know what is of you and what's not. Because it's a crazy world out there. We need spiritual wisdom, Lord. And may we be so... May we know that everyone is included in your gospel message, Lord. May we be so wide with our application, Lord, that everyone knows that you are the answer. And I pray, Lord, that your truths will be ingrained in us. Your ways will be ingrained in us, Lord. So we will know who you are and people will know who you are and your ways by how we live. In your name we pray these things. Amen. Lots of stuff this today. Um, read it. Read Ephesians 1, 2, and 3 if you haven't, and see what God has for you. Go with God. You are loved.